You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson, and I'm here tonight with Kimberly Bruce, and she's going to talk to us about her book, The Gender Link to the Human Soul. How are you, Kimberly? Very good. Thank you. Good. I'm glad you were able to make it today. Yes. Mm-hmm. Would you like to open us in prayer? Yes, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, into our minds, that we may see the things that are of God. Come, Holy Spirit, into our hearts, that we may know the things that are of God. Come, Holy Spirit, into our souls, that we may belong only to God. Sanctify all that we think, say, and do, that all may be for the glory of God. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Um, So this is a rather interesting topic, especially for me, because I teach theology of the body at the undergraduate level and theology of the body and marriage at the graduate level. So um, this should be an interesting conversation. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) So and I uh, had you as a professor in um, at Holy Apostles too. Yes, and, yes. Uh, for one in Triune God, and that was yeah, mm-hmm. very very challenging. But I learned a huge amount. Mm-hmm. Huge amount. Oh, yeah, Thank yeah. You. Anytime, anytime you study Thomas Aquinas seriously, you will learn a whole yes. lot. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. fascinating, fascinating yep. uh, course. I think and fascinating uh, to read anything that Aquinas wrote. Yes. So, yes. Yeah. So speaking of writing, what is it that led you to write this book? Well, um, well, first, I'm Italian, so you're going to notice I'm going to use my hands a lot. Oh, okay. For those, for those of you listening in radio, just envision mm-hmm. me using my hands. Um, well, this wasn't my first dabbling in writing a book. I wrote and published a book in 2011 entitled Look at the Sun, the Fruit of Medjugorje. Sun was spelled mm. S-O-N. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, meaning Jesus, the second person Mm -hmm. of the Trinity. Um, But it was a play on words because a lot of people see the miracle of the sun in Medjugorje as they did in Fatima. So it was kind of Mm -hmm. a play on words in that book. But um, Mm -hmm. in that book was my own kind of, um, I was always a Catholic, but um, I considered myself much more of a lukewarm Catholic until I, you know, when I I went to Medjugorje and I explained the whole, the whole story in that, and that really, really, um, uh, really, made me fall in love with the Catholic faith and, mm-hmm. um, and just, you know, really, you know, kind of changed the trajectory, trajectory mm-hmm. of my mm-hmm. life after that. So that was my first dabbling in writing a book. And then this book, the gender link to the human soul came actually out of my master's thesis, mm-hmm. and, but it was never anything I intended to write on at first. Mm-hmm. My thought always through my, um, theology master's program was I wanted to do a thesis somehow relating Protestant Protestantism and Catholicism. I, I had some ideas of definitely where, where I was going to go with that. Mm-hmm. And uh, because I love our Protestant brothers and sisters, my dad mm-hmm. was a Lutheran Protestant, my grandmother was, and um, I had an idea in my head of where I was going to take my thesis. That mm-hmm. is until I took my last three master's courses um, mm-hmm. in theology and my concentration is in, in apologetics, which is explaining mm-hmm. the faith and defending the faith. So um, one of the classes I chose to take, it was the last one in my track for um, uh, apologetics. I, I picked reading science in the light of faith. Oh, yes. And that class was all about learning to read, you know, heavy duty scientific papers, actual science experiments that are done in the lab. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, by scientists, you know, their whole analyses, mm-hmm. their, how they conducted the experiments, and then their conclusions. And, um, you know, the kind of papers where you have to look up every fifth word in order to understand, yes. you know, what you're reading. Mm-hmm. I found as I began reading these papers, I was giddy with joy. I absolutely loved reading them. Mm -hmm. which was very surprising to me. And it was not because of the experiments that I was reading about, because those were often very horrific, 
they talked mm-hmm. about what they did to, you know, fetuses and even some live fetus, you know, fetuses before, um, just, just horrible things and the things they're doing in the lab with animal and human DNA mm-hmm. and mirrors and stuff that would keep you up at night. Um, yeah. And so it wasn't uh, what was going on in the experiments per se. Um, but the reason actually we were looking at these experiments is we were learning to look at them in the light of faith with an eye for, okay, is this ethical or not what they're doing in this experiment, how they're conducting the experiment. So it's, it's very beneficial. And, and we certainly need more Catholics, you know, in science fields and ethicists who are looking at these things because it's so, so very important. So I wasn't giddy about the experiments themselves, but I loved what I was learning and I had forgotten my love of the biological sciences. Mm -hmm. Originally in my undergrad days, I was a nursing major for two years Mm -hmm. and I had had all the really hard, tough, intense sciences under my belt. At that point, I had had intense anatomy and physiology and biochemistry and um, microbiology and all sorts of, um, you know, I had physics and I had psychologies and sociologies and all that stuff. So I was just eating this up. I loved, I forgot that I really loved learning about this stuff. And I found that I was really actually understanding it probably much more so than the average person who was reading. Mm-hmm. So sure. I did right then and there, when it came time for my thesis, I wanted to do something where I could kind of enmesh the theology and the science um, and, you know, look at something from those two perspectives. But at that point, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. Then after that, I was down to taking two electives. They were my last master's classes. So I said, well, I'm going to pick things that are, you know, have a science and theology kind of, you know, Mm -hmm. pairing. So I chose um, evolution and Catholic thought. And then I took biology and biotechnologies for ethicists. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was done with those last three classes, I had this question swirling and swirling in my head over and over. And I knew it was God designed because I had never thought of this before. And that question was, do we retain our genders in the afterlife? Mm -hmm. And so I decided I needed to ask this. I needed to answer this question for myself. And especially today, there's so much focus on gender. Um, Mm -hmm. We hear about it in the media. You know, and at that point, I was even seeing television shows on where children were supposedly trans, you know, they're trying trans, to change their yeah. gender, you know, train, change mm-hmm. the gender and everything. So I thought, I need to answer this question. Mm-hmm. So one day I was talking to my daughter about it, and she was probably a senior in high school at the time. She was like 17 or 18. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, I decided what I'm going to do my thesis on. And I said, I'm, I'm basically asking the question, are we still going to be male and female in heaven? Mm-hmm. And without missing a beat, she said, of course yeah. not. <laughs> and it took me aback a little bit. And I thought, wow, out of the mouths of babes. Mm-hmm. You know, here was this young woman who was not going to parochial school. She was in a public mm-hmm. school. So she certainly was not hearing this there. And it, mm-hmm. you know. Nobody was talking to her about this subject or anything. It just came up out of her. And uh-huh. and here I am, a woman in my master's theology program, and I'm asking the question. And uh-huh. I honestly didn't know. You know, I had, I really wanted to figure this out. But there is one thing that I did know. I knew that God doesn't create anything in creation without a reason far beyond we can ever imagine. Uh So I knew that his creation of us as male and female had to be incredibly significant, far beyond more than meets the eye. So I did know that. So I started there. um, And then I, I began my research and um, well, first let me do back up for a minute. I also knew that if I did find out for sure that we did retain our genders, then that was so important that that information would need to need to come out in, mm-hmm. in the world because people are so lost and that might help them in making mm-hmm. decisions and deciding what, you know, how to live as gendered people. So I began my research 
But I found I was really bumping up against a wall. Every research term that I was putting in, I was putting in gender and soul and things like that. Mm -hmm. I wasn't getting anything back. I certainly wasn't getting anything that I needed, anything that, that I could use. So that was happening at first. And then all of us were set up with um, the librarian at our school. We each all had a meeting. Mm -hmm. She was helping us learn to conduct this, you know, you know, in-depth research. Mm -hmm. I had my meeting with her and she couldn't find anything either. And, Mm -hmm. and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I spent, I don't know. She even went overtime with me one day trying to Mm -hmm. find information and she couldn't find it. And I thought, wow. Um, but at that point, one of my professors said, you know, this could be groundbreaking because what you're trying to do, bring in some science here, some truths that, you know, we know about, you know, people and, you know, gender uh-huh. and, and, and then you, you want to bring in, um, you know, I knew I needed to bring in the Bible. What does the Bible tell us? And I knew I had to bring in what the church taught us at that point. I, I don't know. I didn't have the whole picture then. I know the Lord just gave it to me and was unwrapping it as, you uh-huh. know, as things went along, but. Um, it wasn't until, and I don't even know when this happened, but all of a sudden, I came upon what John Paul II said. And I was wondering when you were going to mention him. <laughs> in his Theology of the Body, yeah, yeah. and St. Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica. Those were the two gems that I needed. And I mm-hmm. once I had those, oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. That was huge. And that was, yeah. it was such, oh, such gifts to the church. Mm-hmm. You know, and for those who don't know, St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body um, was 129 uh, Wednesday audience talks that he gave mm-hmm. at the Vatican. Um, you know, the Pope comes out every Wednesday, gives an audience, you know, to the pilgrims that are there. And for 129 Wednesdays, the, for the uh-huh. first five years of his pontificate, he decided to use it as a teaching tool on the human body. Uh-huh. So that's what that is. And then Thomas Aquinas Summa Theologica is a compendium of theology that he wrote where he's basically asking questions. You know, every question you could think of about theology uh-huh coming up with the objections to the questions and then also, you know, working through it and coming up with his own conclusions, another incredible gem of the church. That's why he was called a doctor of the church. Mm -hmm. So once I had these two beautiful teachings, um, then I was beginning to find all these philosophers and theologians who were attesting to what these two spiritual giants said. So Mm -hmm. now I'm developing this great, wonderful body of information. And then I am ashamed to say that when I began looking at the Bible for this, it was like I I, I could have had a V8 kind of moment because the prime example of what our own bodily resurrection is going to look like is right there for us when we look at Christ's resurrected body. Mm-hmm. And the Bible tells us all about that. So that yeah. was another, oh my gosh, we have Christ's resurrection. That mm-hmm. is huge in showing us what our own mm-hmm. resurrected bodies are going to look like. He came back in his human male likeness uh, mm-hmm. in every way and including mm-hmm. his gender. In fact, he even said to St. Thomas, put your hand into my hand and your hand into my side. And, um, you know, and then, you know, he, he also is said, you know, touch me and see, uh, you know, a, a, a ghost does not have flesh and bones like you see that mm-hmm. I have. He even had his right. flesh, his bones. Um, and even Thomas Aquinas says he even has his, has his blood. You know, mm-hmm. we're going to have our blood when we rise in the resurrection, because um, if his if his if his blood did not did not rise, then it could not now be transubstantiated into the sacrament of the altar. So mm-hmm. you know, all these beautiful teachings, you know, um, you know, coming out now and in, in, in coming at me once I had these um, the gems and then logically, then after that, after knowing about Christ's resurrection, well, that led to me realizing, okay, then we can also look at the Blessed Mother's Assumption, because Mm -hmm. she too has her body now, body and soul, as Catholics Mm -hmm. believe, they were assumed into heaven. So Mm -hmm. she has her body as well. And that 
then leads to, okay, she comes in church approved Marian apparitions. Mm -hmm. In these apparitions, just like Jesus between his resurrection and ascension, she comes in her human female Mm -hmm. body. It's her, you know, glorified body, just like, you know, but it's, it's, you know, her feminine body. And so Mm -hmm. she shows that to us. So, um, after that, then, you know, when I look at the church, you know, I brought in the church teaching. What does the church tell us? The church teaches that we are a body soul composite Mm -hmm. together Mm -hmm. and they will be resolved again into two parts in the general resurrection. So, you know, again, that's huge as Christians, we believe in the resurrection, but I think none of us are really thinking about that. Um, because we're too busy living this life. We're living this life right now. We know we haven't even experienced mortal death yet. And we're all fearful of that. So, and then, yes, we want our souls to go to God. Yes. We think about that, but we're not really then thinking, okay, but then, you know, later, 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 our bodies are going to rise. So I think Mm -hmm. tend not to think about that, but if we did, I mean, that's we have Jesus to look at. We have his resurrected body and we have the blessed mothers and we see that they maintain their human likeness in every way. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, Thomas Aquinas, you know, not only, you know, he talks about, you know, all the different things that will follow us into the next life. um, But he also says that our, um, our quantities will, will be different, meaning, some men are going to be shorter. Some will be taller in the afterlife. You know, we'll have different hair color because we're going, we all have an individual unique nature. Not only do we have the nature of being a human being, but we have our individual nature, the way God made us. So mm-hmm. we're going to, um, you know, some are taller, some are shorter, some, are, you know, different hair color, eye color, whatever. Um, but he also says, Nate, it will be, you know, these perfected bodies of ours. Um they're going to be, um, you know, our perfected bodies are going to be perfectly subject to our, to our souls and our souls are going to be perfectly subject to God. So um, these perfected bodies will also be able to do things um, probably very much like, like Christ did where he could walk through walls and, you know, you know, Mm. those kinds of things like that he did when he was on earth between his resurrection and ascension, you know, people might wonder, okay, well, why did that happen? Or will that, will we be the same? Well, we can look to him and it very well may be that and as a glor- you know, glorified bodies that we, we will be able to do that as well, because our wills are going to be so subject to God in that point. Um, St. Uh, Tom Aquinas also talks about though that, you know, in this perfected body, things will, anything will be corrected that, you know, anything will be corrected in the, you know, from, you know, workings of nature, like say we were born without an arm, well, we're going to have that arm, you know, when we're, you know, resurrected, or if say we get burned in a fire here down on earth, and our skin is, you know, um, Mm -hmm. know, totally burned all over, well, that's going to be perfected in the afterlife. So uh, as well, any imperfections in man regarding say even his gender or chromosomes, hormones, everything that will be, that will be perfected in the life to come. So some people then may say, well, then, then it doesn't matter, you know, what I do here on earth because I'm going to be perfected in the afterlife, you know, Mm -hmm. but it does matter because it doesn't mean we're going to go you know, straight to heaven. I mean, our bodies may rise, but they may go to hell too. So what yeah. we do with our bodies does matter and it makes a mm-hmm. difference. Mm-hmm. And it mattered what Christ did with his body. And that mm-hmm. is hugely significant. It matters what he did with his own body that, you know, because of what he went through, we, the gates of heaven have been open to us. Mm-hmm. So it matters what we do here with our bodies. That's very important. Um, one thing that I, um, came across in doing this research and it, um, I think it was one of the most interesting things I found and it was by Dr. Peter Kraft, Mm -hmm. uh, wonderful, wonderful, uh, philosopher. And it has to do 
with our body soul relationship after mm-hmm. um, in, in the life to come. And the, it, I, I got to um, be at a conference once where he was a, a speaker mm-hmm. and it, he is such a gem, you know, for again, anybody listening, he's in his nineties now, or no, he's in his eighties. Now he's written over 90 books. He teaches still at Boston college and King's college. Mm-hmm. And he, again, is, is another gem in the church. And when I went to listen to him this particular day, he has the most wonderful, gentle, quiet manner of explaining deep philosophical um, things to you such that anybody could understand him after he's done speaking to you. Uh, it was just, it's just amazing. And the way he, he um, gets things across, he was, he almost reminded me a bit of a GK Chesterton. They both have a little humor, but yet he's, at least when I heard him this particular day, so uh, gentle and quiet and Mm -hmm. made so much sense. And so when I read this in the book, again, um, I could almost just picture him, you know, speaking and teaching about this, but he points to the three accounts. Now Jesus appeared to so many people. It says the Bible says, you know, 500 plus people between his resurrection and ascension. It was probably way more than that because it was 500 at one day. And then, you know, when you add in all the apostles and disciples and Mary and who knows how many people he appeared to, but they all saw him in his human male body. They recognized him. However, there's three occasions in the Bible where they don't recognize him right away. Mm-hmm. First one is Mary Magdalene when mm-hmm. she goes to the tomb after Christ has been raised. But she goes to the tomb, she looks in, she sees the two angels there, and she sees the uh, Jesus's uh, clothes, you know, all wrapped up in a ball. Mm-hmm. And then she sees a gardener who she thinks is a gardener outside, but it's really Jesus. And she says, um, Oh, you know, do you, do you, can you tell me where they've laid my master? Where did they take him? And, and Jesus looks at her and says, Mary. And at that moment, she recognized him and said, uh-huh. which means teacher. So she uh-huh. recognized him when he said, Mary, the second time is the disciples when they're on the road to Emmaus. Again, Jesus had just died. These two disciples are beside themselves with grief don't know what they're going to do now. And they're on the way and they meet this traveler coming along with them who is Jesus, but they don't recognize him at first. And, you know, the traveler is acting like he doesn't know what they're talking about. So they're like, do you not know what just happened here? And so they go in and they're explaining to him, um, you know, what's just happened the past few days. And Mm -hmm. Jesus starts breaking open the scriptures to them saying, well, you know, it says in the scriptures, this was going to happen to, you know, Jesus, the the Messiah and everything. Mm -hmm. So -hmm. their hearts are burning within them because it's all making sense. It's coming together. So they invite Jesus to go and um, have dinner with them. And it is during the breaking of the bread that um, they recognize that Mm -hmm. it's Jesus and then he disappears from their sight. Mm -hmm. The third instance is when the um, apostles are in a boat fishing. Again, Jesus has just died. Again, they go back to what they know best because now, again, they're beside beside themselves. They go back to what they know. They're fishing. And so they go out fishing and they catch no fish. Mm. And this man from the shore, who is really Jesus, says to them, children, have you caught any fish? And they say, no. And he said, cast your nets to the right. So they cast their nets to the right and they haul in such a huge load of fish that they, you know, again, barely take it in. And at that point, John looks at Peter and in the boat says, it is the Lord. And so Mm -hmm. Peter jumps out of the boat and then they go to shore and Jesus has cooked them breakfast on the shore. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Peter Christ says that it is not until a word or action of Christ that takes place, do do they recognize it? Mm -hmm. And what he's saying, this is indicative of the new body soul relationship, you know, you know, outside of the fall, you know, that not subject to the fall of mankind. And he says, right now in the life we're, you know, we're in right now, we recognize someone via the body. Like I see you, mm-hmm. Cynthia. Hi, Cynthia, I know it's you. Okay. By looking yeah. at you. 
He said in the life to come, it appears it is reversed, where we will recognize body through character. So yes, Mm -hmm. somebody's still going to have their body. Mm -hmm. Part of us, God created them as good. We are going to have our bodies, but we are going to actually now in the future world, it appears, recognize someone's character first. That's what's going to jump out at us. Their Mm -hmm. their soul It's beautiful, really. And that that was such um, an incredible discovery in this whole research process Mm -hmm. that I found. And it totally made sense. It made sense to something that I could never understand and probably most people can't understand. So Mm -hmm. um, again, showing us that Jesus must have laughed in all those cases because he's, you know, you know, uh, is giving us this little taste of um, what that new relationship will be like. John Paul II says um, about that, he says, you know, um, when they find him, uh, there's a little fear. They have reverence and fear, but but they notice they perceive a difference in him. You know, yeah. at that point, they perceive that difference. So um, he's the same yet different, and mm-hmm. that's what he will be too. Yeah, I think there's some of that. I think already, um, because um, I think it's the soul that we're responding to. I mean, when we, you know, we think that it's just the body when we see someone, but. Um, I've told this story many times, but I'll I'll keep it brief. When my husband died, I was with him. And, um, you know, I mean, I obviously saw his body after his soul had left, but I could tell when his soul left because the room felt empty. And, you know, before there were two of us, then there was just me. But I also had a strong sensation or sensation might not be the right word that Jesus had taken him and had taken him somewhere else that he did not end. And, you know, so it's really, to me, we don't realize when we're with, you know, sometimes you're near somebody and you don't feel right. It's like something's wrong. It's not their body. That's making you feel that way. It's something wrong inside, you know, so um, I'd never really, I'd never really thought that much about it until uh, until Jimmy died. But there was no question in my mind that I knew when he was gone, mm-hmm. and it was, his body was there, obviously. So people don't really, you know, we talk about a body soul unity, but we don't really think about it. No. You know? yeah. We th- you know, we see someone who's a good person. We say, oh, they, they've got a nice personality or, you know, they've got good character. But that's not coming from the physical body. Right. Right. Yeah. It's the soul that animates the body. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. But we never think about that. No, we don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, And it's weird, too, you know, because you can walk into a place and you can tell someone else is there even when you can't see them. <laughs> You know, it's like it. It's like I'm so conscious of that uh, since he uh, since he died because it is that's what we're picking up on. Yeah, it's you know, it's really interesting. It is. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in chapter four, I get into gender sin in the fall and the whole reason mm-hmm. why we you know, fell in the first place. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, I talk about what happened in the garden and, um, you know, in that sin, when they, Adam and Eve, you know, they hear God walking in the garden and then they hide themselves because they're naked. But Mm -hmm. John Paul II says it's really, they're really not ashamed because of their gendered nakedness. He said they're really ashamed because now they recognize they have concupiscence to sin and lust that was never there before Mm -hmm. um you know before their love for each other was completely other centered Mm -hmm. so it was perfect Mm -hmm. now they're selfish and um so that sin ruptured that communion that original Mm -hmm. communion that man and women were designed to have and we've ruptured that communion with our god in that, at, in that moment. And then that, mm-hmm. that ruptures 
the communion between man and woman. Um, and then it, I thought it very interesting when, uh, you know, when God created Adam, he first, um, you know, he gave Adam dominion and he told him he could name all the animals and he does. Mm-hmm. And this was very interesting too. You know, the Lord, he, he made, you know, in all the animals in the whole animal kingdom, the plant world, the, you know, um, you know, the fish in the sea, they're gendered beings as well, you know? So mm-hmm. God put that, I think it to constantly um, mimics, not the right word, but just uh, to constantly reaffirm for us, this gender complementarity, even in the species around us, it's not the same type of com- complementarity oh. that we have as human beings at all, but it's, it's a constant reinforcement, I think, of the, the need for the different, the male and female genders in all, all of creation around us. But when mm-hmm. he, so he created Adam and God didn't make a mistake about not creating woman. Um, you know, he didn't forget to make women. He waited and let, to let Adam see that mm-hmm. there was something missing, that he needed something else, um, that he wasn't fully complete you know, by himself, he didn't have the reciprocity with the animals that he was really deeply looking for. And so then, um, you know, because, and the reason why is man was created with an intellect and a will, which these, these other animals, they did not have, they didn't have the intellect and will that he did. So, um, God creates woman, says, I'm going to make you a suitable helpmate, makes the woman. And Adam is like, ah, at last, bone of my bones, flesh of my mm-hmm. flesh. Now he had someone to have that reciprocity with mm-hmm. and someone to have that complementarity with, which is um, the huge word, huge word for John Paul II, talk, you know, who talks about our complementarity and how we were made, um, made for each other um, on purpose. and. Mm-hmm. You know, it, Thomas Aquinas talks about that too. And, you know, here we got somebody centuries ago talking about this. And then John Paul too, they talk about it. It's the same, but a little different. And Thomas Aquinas is funny because he talks about how it, you know, we, the, our, our different sexes, we were made for each other. We fill the gap. We're filling the gap for, you know, any, for each other. Um, mm-hmm. Because we each have different, different um, things that, that, Um, we bring to the table. And when I talk about science in the beginning, a little bit about science, I'm no scientist, but I, I wanted to get into like the, the brain differences. So like, I wanted to show how not only are our bodies different, oh yeah, but our brains, they are discovering Mm -hmm. more and more about the differences between the male and female brains. It's shocking. Yeah. In fact, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, well, I mean, it's the brain is nothing more than a part of the body. It, you know, it's uh, the computer, so to speak. But um, we're different even in how we feel pain. Uh, we're different in our emotions. I mean, it's like we are very, you know, so to me, when you're talking about uh, the whole creation, you know, we're different from the animals. It's, we are definitely Although we are physical beings and have many of the characteristics of the animals, we are not just that. We are person. And there's two types. <laughs> right. Yes. I won't say which one's better. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, there are two types and we're really very different. I mean, yes. even... Even when you look at how, I mean, not to say that there's not sometimes overlap, but, you know, right, um, right. I, I told my class once when I was teaching theology of the body, I said, you know, there's a real difference between men and women and the women in the class. Are like, ah. It's like, all right, here's a good example. How men see geometrical things move in space, right? So men drive a car, kid drives a car, you know, 18 year old boy. He's going down the highway, zigzag, zigzag, 80 miles an hour, and goes home. A woman does it, a girl, you know, young teenager, she'll die. It's because we can't, women cannot process the movement. I remember when I first heard that, and I thought, well, that's not very useful. But, you know, if you consider you're out hunting or you're out driving, 
you know, it's, it's amazing the differences between us, but we don't, we don't even see them because they're so natural, Mm -hmm. you know, so they are part of, they're just part of the way we are. And usually we don't think anything of it. Right. And uh, science is just, you know, starting to just scratch the surface on, even we can find brains, we have different Mm-hmm. makeups in the gray matter and the white matter in the brain. Yep, yep, yep. Um, I was mm-hmm. just reading something today about um, the, the men's brain. It's like, it's the processing just like things within, within each hemisphere and mm-hmm. the women's are going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth between the two hemispheres. And That's, we yeah. think differently. We process information differently. We have different emotions. We have different hormones that are, you know, flowing through us. Mm-hmm. So we're made very differently. We're made to complement each other. Um, you know, we need each other. We're made to need each other. Like we need our God where we, you know, it's to remind us we're, we're by ourselves, mm-hmm. um, you know, we need we need each other. We need God. We need mm-hmm. our God. Um, and also, oh, oh, go ahead. Part of what you're talking about when you're talking about the brain is that that I don't remember what the bridge is between the two hemispheres, the names of it, the name of it. But um, it varies in, I guess I would say, strength uh, between men and women. I found that fascinating. I'm, friends with Don DeMarco. I don't know if you know of him. He's a very famous philosopher that used to teach here. And, uh, you know, he was telling, you know, again, I was sitting there listening to him. He goes, well, you know, that bridge between the two hemispheres is much stronger in men than, um, uh, is much stronger in women than in men. And I'm like, so what? <laughs> but you know what? That's why we're more, in- we literally are more intuitive. So, you know, my husband can see something and analyze it, but he cannot necessarily see what will happen if certain paths are taken. And it's because that bridge between our two hemispheres is so much bigger in women or stronger. I don't know what the right term is, but stuff is flying back and forth. And meanwhile, in the man, it's like, (laughs) you know, so it it just fascinates me. You're right. We're so complementary to each other. Yes, it's in yeah. it's focus. Their brains are made yeah. to, they're able to focus yes. on tasks and outcomes. Yep. Where women, we're processing information and emotions all at the same time. Yep. That's like, yep. well, sometimes women don't forget things. They have a long, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. But, you know, I always I, say that. We never forget. Yeah, yeah. And I also think that it's, it has it absolutely must have something to do with the fact that we're mothers. We always we have yeah. to do something, but then listening for the baby crying. You know, where's our child, you know, where men has got to go out, got to hunt right now. That's their focus, you know, yeah, yeah. Um, that's kind of simplified, but yet it's true. It is um, true. And, you and know, it's something that doesn't change with age, you right. know, so that maternal instinct, if I dare call it that publicly, because we know how upset people can get, but that maternal instinct and that maternal care, I'm 71. I still have that, even though I'm obviously not going to be having babies. Mm-hmm. But it's like how I respond to my grandchildren, to my great grandchildren, you know, is not the way my husband will. Right. Because, you know, so it's it's it never changes. It's just really part of our makeup. Right. My my husband, the first time he read this, read this book or read it when it was a thesis, he reads the whole thing. And out of all this, what what the first thing he says and he's shocked is about is our brain differences. He can't believe mm-hmm. how different our brains are. And I yeah. think it's probably because he's in the business world and he has both men and women reporting to him. And I think it was probably mm-hmm. an eye opener that, wow, they think different. We think different. Yeah, yeah and, we do. You know, where that didn't phase me in the least because I see it all, all the time. You know, I, I'm mm-hmm. married to my husband and I have two sons and, well, I know we think yeah. differently. So that, that wasn't such mm-hmm. a surprise to me at all. To me, yeah. I found the theology helped to explain the science. Yes. And, you yes. know, that's mm-hmm. really what it is, like John Paul. Yes. Saying, it's, yeah. you know, faith and, they, and reason, yeah. you know, are the two wings necessary to rise in the com- mm-hmm. contemplation mm-hmm. of the truth. You know, we we need we need all all these things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And we, it's really we're not a complete. You know, that's that's one of the beauties of marriage is that in many ways we do complete each other. Yes. Um, you know, it's. Uh, it's just interesting to see how that whole domestic uh, framework takes place. 
over time, you know, when you marry and you're young and you're crazy in love and, you know, then you've got a family and eventually the family goes. It's like, it's just interesting to see how that relationship and the dynamics between the husband and wife and also all the rest of the family, you know, goes on through time, Mm -hmm. decades of time. Yes. Yes. You know, so we're, God really did a good job when he made us, (laughs) (laughs) you know, so, and we're just now starting to discover I mean, can you imagine how much more they'll know 200 years from now? Exactly. Exactly. I think they're going to know so much more about us as gendered beings, as males and females. That's Mm -hmm. going to be, there are things we haven't even realized yet that, you know, that where our differences, you know, Mm -hmm. are going to show up. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's so important Mm -hmm. for the world to know today, you know, Mm -hmm. um, because, it's especially important now yes. because gender, you know, the whole distinction between the sexes or even being able to change your sex or thinking that you're something that you're not um, is so in the front of everything. I, just a few years ago, I was taking an MFA in writing um, and when we got the it, at another school, not at Holy Apostles. And we received the course evaluation at the end. And one of the first questions was, it was like multi pieces, you know, um, what gender do you identify as? What do you want to be called? And I mean, it was like her, she, there were other words, I mean, masculine words too, but there were other words for female and male. Um, and, you know, uh, what were you what were you assigned at birth? And do you agree with that? And I was like, what? <laughs> no, I mean, it, it just really struck me as odd because, I mean, I mean, you know, if you're a, a girl or a boy when you're a little kid, <laughs> you know, you know, so I don't know. But anyway, so it's especially Uh, important now that's one of the reasons I enjoy teaching theology of the body and you know marriage and theology of the body at the graduate level because it's so important it is is. you know people aren't getting up in the morning making this stuff up they're actually Mm -hmm. thinking they're right right you know and so it's not enough to say well no you're wrong (laughs) yes you You need to back it up up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah exactly Mm-hmm. And I think too, it, you know, if it, uh, you know, was, you know, preached more too, I, it would absolutely mm-hmm. help, but mm-hmm. this, you know, help, you know, all yeah. I can think of is, and this is why I felt it would be, you know, it would be easy to just have finished my thesis and get my grade and put it on a shelf. But then I felt the responsibility. I mm-hmm. felt, okay, if I've discovered this, if I put these things together, the science, mm-hmm. the theology, what the Bible says, what the church teaches, J.P. Mm-hmm. Thomas Aquinas, okay, and I've answered this question as best I can, then I felt the responsibility. I have to yeah. bring it out. Um, because Jesus says, uh, you know, the truth will set you free. And yeah, it will. God says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. So mm-hmm. souls are perishing for lack of this knowledge. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's why I felt it so important to have to, um, you know, to, yeah. to, you know, and put it in book form. It's important. You know, it's not it just the fact that it's in book form, but people might listen. You know, there's a lot of um, anti-clericalism. It's like, you know, who is this priest to tell me how I live my life? something like that, or, you know, sisters, I don't think get that as much. Um, But, you know, to have a regular, normal person, we're hoping, no, (laughs) a regular, (laughs) normal person um, with a good personality, uh, be able to talk about this intelligently with examples and reasons, that's important. You know, the average person I, if that's got any questions like that is probably not going to go to a parish priest or a sister. But, you know, they might feel comfortable talking to you. Mm-hmm. So, and remember something that I've always told people, 
when they do something that I think is important, you never know the influence you have. You might say something to one person and it changes their life, but you'll never know it until you're dead. Mm-hmm. Well, that does sort of dampen it, doesn't it? <laughs> when you're dead and resurrected. But yeah, so, you know, I had... I came across that. I, you know, you know it, but you don't really know it. I had written a paper oh, probably 20 years ago and a priest that was a friend of mine that I was working with came up and he said, oh, you know, I talked to him. I went out to Wyoming and I was talking with one of my friends and he said, oh, you work with that Tulin woman. She's I just read her paper and I taught it to my to my parish. And it was like, really? <laughs> wow. You know? So you never know. You know, and you won't, and none of us will really know until we're dead and resurrected the full extent right. of our influence. But, right. but I think what you've done is important. This is uh, such a is such a hot topic now in so many ways. People don't have the information to deal with it, um, and again, they're not going to go to the parish priest to talk about it. So, you know, I think you, you know, even if you only impact one person that could mean the world to that one person Mm -hmm. but I think you'll impact a lot more well I hope so yeah (laughs) yeah well we all do some of us make it and some of us might (laughs) you never know your influence yep yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. So was there anything else that was uh, really important that you wanted to mention? Um, A particular quote of John, Father Don Calloway stands out in my mind too. He said, if, um, and I might not be quoting it exactly here, but he said, Mm -hmm. if the Virgin Mary had rebelled against her own body, her own feminine body, he said, we would be in a very different situation today. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, that's very significant too, Mm -hmm. because he was trying to tell us that um, she teaches, teaches us how to accept our bodies, how Mm -hmm. to accept our genders. Look, Mm -hmm. God God called her to something as a young, young girl and Mm -hmm. gender was a huge part of that. Mm -hmm. You Mm -hmm. you never know what God's going to call you to, but he, he has called us by name and he formed us in our mother's womb. So he knows he had a, has a purpose for each of our, you know, our genders. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, she was brave, you know, um, because at that point in uh, in the culture she was living in, um, people were considered um, married, uh, even when they weren't literally married. It was like what we'd call an engagement. Yes. And so Joseph knew he hadn't slept with her. And so for her to be pregnant would imply, and I mean, that was, she was often called an adulteress yes, because she was, although not legally married, culturally married at that time. And it was like, you know, that's, that takes backbone. It takes backbone. And, you know, fortunately God gave Joseph the intelligence to know that she wasn't. And then, of course, explained it. But um, I was always impressed with that. That you know. But I mean, consider that she takes on the, the devil. <laughs> you know, yeah. very yeah. brave woman. <laughs> you know? yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Another thing yeah. here too in her apparitions, you talk about wanting to become come to Earth and be recognized as a female. You know, she came, she wears dresses, rings, um, mm-hmm. you know, um, yes. a necklace. It, and this just struck me too. At La Salette, she came and she had shoes with gold buckles and pearls on them. I mean, mm-hmm. she was trying to definitely stand out as a woman, you know? Yeah, yeah. You know, and they're, they're good point. beings and they could come to earth dressed any, she and Jesus could come any way they, you know, dress any way they like, but no, they chose to come dressed and be recognized and understood mm-hmm. that they yeah. were in full possession of their gendered bodies. So yes. it's also very significant. That is, I like that. I like that. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, well, let's, uh, I hope you sell a lot of those because I think that people need that information and um, 
you know, I'm kind of disappointed you never took my theology of the body course. But I know, <laughs> I know. I wish I did because, boy, I learned so much since I, you know, since yeah. I, you know, yeah. I'm reading it now, and you know, yeah, yeah. It. it's such a gift, such a gift. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Well, I've really enjoyed talking to you, and uh, I think you you've got a nice piece of work there. And I think it'll do a lot of good. Thank you. I appreciate You're welcome. it. welcome. Yep. Yeah. Um, would you like to close us in prayer? Sure. Um, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Hail, Holy Queen, Mother of Mercy, our life, our sweetness, and our hope. To thee do we cry, poor banished children of Eve. To thee do we send up our sighs, mourning and weeping in this valley of tears. Turn then, O most gracious advocate, thine eyes of mercy towards us. And after this, our exile, show unto us the blessed fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O clement, O loving, O sweet Virgin Mary, pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. And uh, I hope that you write another book and we have another interview. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. Okay. You take care. Night, Cynthia. Yeah. Good night. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.